Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby Preface Whatever be the ideas of the public upon a glance at the title page of this work, it is not intended to pander to the morbid desire for the sensational or horrible characteristic of weak minds. This volume is not a literary morgue. Mankind is constantly astonished by reports of mishaps and disasters of manifold character, when there is seldom room for astonishment. A large proportion of the calamities reported from day to day are directly due to the haste, greed, and heedlessness of man himself, and need no comment. But there is a large class of disasters due solely to meteorological or geological conditions which surpass all others in magnitude and appalling destruction. In such cases, men insist on prating about mysterious visitations, as though these occurrences were subject to the dominion of no law. To an examination of such is this book devoted. When in school, the writer was often struck by the persistence with which even the most diligent students would call upon the teachers of physics and chemistry to suspend the recitation and devote the time to illustrative experiments. Physical geography was constantly pronounced very dry because of the scarcity of opportunities for illustration. The writer has endeavored to present, in a form acceptable to the popular palate, the general principles of the storm and earthquake so far as they are understood, and numerous narratives of great disturbances have been inserted that a clearer conception of the magnitude of these agencies and their relative importance may be attained by the reader. Much care has been spent in steering between Scylla and Charybdis. While it has been designed to avoid merely scientific data, there has been the equally delicate task of avoiding prolix narration and mere sensational tales. It is hoped that the result will be useful and interesting. If the book shall lead the reader to higher views of the reign of inexorable law in nature and to a profounder reverence for the author of law and his works, the labor of its compilation will not have been spent in vain. A. H. Godby End of Preface Floods in the South Mother dear, the water's coming after. Mother, tis between us and the hill. Looking down, they see the flood with laughter, lapping idly neath the window sill mother in the water we are wading mother it grows deeper as we go hasten children hasten day is fading higher creeps the river black and slow mother tis so deep and we are dripping mother we are sinking haste oh haste in her arms uplifting them and gripping on she plunges wading to the waist flowers the river snatches while it calls so Flowers its lean hands never snatched before. Will it snatch these human flowers also, where they cling, sad creatures of the shore? Every country is confronted with a serious problem in its great rivers. In some lands the only problem is how to get rid of flood water as quickly as possible. In others comes the additional question of securing sufficient water for irrigation during the dry season. Egypt occupies an anomalous position, the latter question being the only one of any practical interest. Without rains, she depends on the rise of the Nile for her existence, and no one dreams of such a thing as endeavoring to check the overflow. During seed time, the fellaheen may be seen sometimes in mud knee-deep, 
busily planting their fields and in summer they may be seen hoisting water from the stream and emptying it into their irrigating ditches in our own land we have hitherto had no need of irrigation except in those districts where there is no fear of a flood such as the arid regions of our southwestern states in china the people are contending with both sides of the problem and their success in the second feature has not greatly surpassed their achievements in the first in most other lands the flood problem is the chief one the amazon at flood time rises from sixty to one hundred feet and its volume is almost inconceivable but since the larger part of its course lies in an almost uninhabited region the high water gives no concern to the people the orinoco rises so high and is in such a level region that during part of the year one of its upper tributaries flows backward and reaches the amazon the great length of the mississippi and missouri present the gravest difficulties the sources of each lie in regions where heavy snows fall during a considerable part of the winter and all the melting snows of the central portion of the country from western pennsylvania to colorado montana and central dakota must find their way to the sea by way of the single stream by reason of the difference in latitude and altitude the melted snows of the headwaters usually swell the lower river in may and early in june after the spring rains are over but it quite often happens that after unusually heavy winter snows the warm weather sets in in the mountains very early so that the great floods of the upper valleys reach the lower river just when extremely heavy rains are prevalent in the central and southern regions this forms a combination that is terrible to combat and is the cause of all the trouble the present system is effective in ordinary cases but for the occasional great exceptions it has hitherto proved insufficient we do not seem to be any nearer a practical solution of the problem than when it first presented itself yet the government of the united states spends millions of dollars every year in attempts which have so far at least proved totally futile to confine the great river within its banks and so avoid the perils which every spring threaten an area larger than all new england and the middle states the wonderful and often terrible changes that come with the changes of season and which produce such effects as the illustrations show are simply inconceivable to one who has not seen them that a stream so quiet and comparatively small as the mississippi is at low water should become a raging torrent of twenty miles average width and ten feet average depth from shore to shore throughout the eleven hundred miles from cairo to the sea is simply incredible until one has seen it this river however did that in eighteen eighty two when the great general overflow occurred unnumbered lives were lost that year and the damage to property was never even estimated details were hard to get when communication was so nearly cut off as it was then and after the floods were over no effort was made to reckon the extent of the disaster since that spring the reports have not indicated any flood equal to the present one and the only reason why this year has not proved as disastrous as eighteen eighty two is that the levees have been strengthened since then the fact however that the levee system has as a whole successfully withstood the pressure of the highest water known for many years is by no means as reassuring as it seems on first consideration for there is a grave reason to believe that the levees themselves serve to increase the very danger against which they are a guard the planters of the earlier days made efforts to protect themselves by means of levees a name given by the french to dikes or artificial banks and meaning simply raised places but of later years both state and national resources have been spent freely in endeavoring to curb the restless giant more than twenty five million dollars has been spent in this way since the war the mississippi river commission organized in eighteen seventy nine under the supervision of the war department as the signal service has been had nominally in view the increasing of facilities for navigation 
but as the methods employed for the two objects have necessarily been much the same no little has been done for protection the character of the lower mississippi and its valley gravely increased the difficulties of the case its bed has been worn for ages through a somewhat elevated region and at present the resultant valley has a width varying from twenty to one hundred and fifty miles the result has been that the channel of the river shifts continually and is extremely crooked literally turning time and again to every conceivable point of the compass these curves present the most vexatious features the levee system must contend with for it is easily perceived that the levee on the convex side of the bend in the river has the current erected full against it adding the great eroding power of the water to the weight it must sustain the levees are relied on as the chief aid to the work of the commission but the commission does not construct them or even work directly to strengthen them these levees are nothing more than artificial banks or heaps of soil shoveled up along the line of the natural banks the commission is working to narrow the wide places in the river so as to secure a uniform width of three thousand feet this is done by constructing revetments consisting principally of mattresses of wire and brush which are secured by rubble stone in other places great quantities of stone are dumped and various similar means are used to encourage the scour in the shallower parts of the river and also to prevent the undermining of the natural or artificial banks on a convex shore where the water is shoal the levee has been carried along the river edge as near as possible as there is no danger under such conditions of a caving bank where the bank is liable to give way the levees are placed further back and where a break in the levee itself has occurred from the caving of the bank loops are made joining the two broken parts it must be borne in mind that the banks proper along the river are about forty feet high above low water and as the river rises five to seven feet over these banks the levees are constructed of sufficient height to restrain the waters within their proper limits the material is found on the spot either clay or sand as the case may be a so-called muck ditch a few feet wide is dug along the center line of the projected levee down to where the earth is comparatively free from all organic matter such as grass and roots of trees by this method some adhesion to the ground is gained and the artificial construction is not easily swept away the earth is taken from the front of the levee line as near the water as the circumstances will permit standard levees have a crown or width at the top of eight feet except in the case of a very low levee when the crown is not less than its height the side slopes are one vertical to three or three and a half horizontal present levees are carried up from two to three feet above the high water mark of their position the river channel in general in the upper danger region adheres to the right side of the valley and on the left the danger lies chiefly at a few points where the bluffs recede considerably from the river throughout the middle and lower flood districts the bends of the stream are so numerous and capricious that the danger lies equally upon either side of the stream hence the levee system is not uniform the whole alluvial front of the river is levied on the left bank the principal line extending from horn lake just below memphis to vicksburg covering the great yazoo basin on the right bank of the river there are four principal sections which are liable to be overflowed the first is known as st francis front which runs from commerce missouri to the st francis river the white river front is the second extending from helena arkansas to the mouth of the white and arkansas river the third and fourth known as the tensis and the achafalaya fronts run respectfully from the arkansas river to the red river in louisiana and from the red river to new orleans the first two sections have received no government work except in limited localities where it was merely incidental to the work of river improvement undertaken by the commission and those fronts are everywhere exposed to the overflow except where private enterprise has done the work 
the social circle levy near laconia arkansas is an example and a notable one of what has been done by the residents these unprotected tracts have all been submerged and the lowlands turned into an enormous lake the overflow waters that pass over the upper part of this section spread over the northeastern part of arkansas as far back as the high ground reaching their greatest width about opposite memphis and then pass back into the mississippi by way of the st francis river the overflow below helena is carried back by the white river from arkansas city down the river comprising the third and fourth sections is completely levied throughout all the lowland districts are hundreds of farms and valuable plantations the soil being built up by ages of alluvial deposits most of the towns are built on high ground there being a few notable exceptions a general flood in this valley means that millions of acres of land are submerged and such crops as are in the fields are destroyed more frequently the land is flooded just at planting time and the land remains wet too long to allow certain crops to be planted in season and thus the water in the flooded districts may abate in time to allow a fair cotton crop while the chance for corn is lost fences and small outbuildings are floated away and often large numbers of stock are drowned but after all the chief damage is usually indirect the evil of hindrance rather than of destruction further the retiring water leaves numerous pools and marshes that are rank breeders of malaria adding vastly to the unhealthiness of the country in many places there are marshy or timber tracts adjacent to the river that are not available for cultivation in these districts the levees are often erected at the border of the cultivable land so that the river has a large area of waste land over which to spread the surplus water without doing any injury such areas really aid to reduce the high water level in some cases a second or third levee is built some hundreds of yards to the rear to serve as a sort of reserve in case the river break through the first doubtless the reader has pictured to himself a flooded district as something like a stream in a mountain gorge an immense torrent of water rushing at racehorse speed uprooting trees tearing away huge boulders sweeping away houses in an instant without a moment's warning and drowning young and old by scores if such be his idea he will find it necessary to remodel it rather to cast it away entirely let him follow a guide to the scene of danger a great levy the protection of thousands of acres of rich lands and perhaps millions of dollars worth of property is announced unsafe sometimes it is decided to abandon the river line weaken for long distances and erect a new levy some hundreds of yards to the rear but if the design be to hold the line already established then the scene is an animated one all along the narrow ridge of earth patrolmen are watching the work at every point hundreds of men work day and night throwing up and strengthening the levees upon which the salvation of the district depends break after break occurs and it is as fast mended the waves caused by the rough march winds sends great volumes of water splashing over the weak embankment almost washing the men off their feet the work is continued all day force relieving force at night thousands of lanterns flashing in the darkness as the men pass to and fro with wheelbarrows filled with sacks of earth and lumber present a scene weird and ghostly at intervals during the night the sound of steam whistles tell of some new break some new danger to face and overcome often the negroes seem little disposed to work even at good wages preferring to sit on the levee and fish but when the danger is fully upon them they can work furiously sometimes in leading the forlorn hope some energetic old fellow may shout to his terrified pious brethren this is no time for praying go to work out on the border districts where help is not easily obtained even the wives and daughters of planters ladies of culture and refinement it may be sometimes turn out and toil in the mud and rain 
contending with the foe that threatens their homes if the levees before a great city be threatened as frequently occurs the scene becomes still more exciting business is almost entirely suspended in the city and the clerks in the dry goods stores the lawyers the merchants and the common laborers stand shoulder to shoulder with picks and shovels fighting the common enemy what the outcome will be no one knows all are alarmed hundreds of boats are moored to back doors ready for use when the worst shall come merchants have placed their goods high up in their stores hoping the waters will not reach them when they rise housekeepers have packed up their goods out of the way of the water and laid in stores enough to last for weeks in case it becomes necessary to stay indoors for that length of time all railway communications with the outside world is cut off nearly all the tracks being several feet under water the mails are sent miles away by boat such cases were frequent in the recent floods greenville mississippi is one of the towns that suffered much the water from crevices above came down upon the town and were stopped by a levee around the city but while the enemy in the rear could be held in check it was not so easy to repel the attack upon the river front and here the water won the day all efforts were in vain the forlorn and miserable city appeared as though some savage caricaturist had endeavored to perpetrate a burlesque upon venice a few skiffs crept about the muddy currents that answered for streets on outhouses and fences occasionally might be seen a few melancholy looking fowls here some grocer paddled about to see if his patrons wanted aught yonder went a funeral party in a single boat many a weary mile would have to be traversed to reach a dry grave the lower floors of most houses lay beneath the water and from the second story disconsolate people looked out upon the turbid waste wondering what the end would be if the scene upon the levee is exciting when efforts are made to avoid breaks still more so it is when a small break is being closed the scurrying to and fro the hoarse shouting of orders the wild cries for aid from threatened points men plunging up to their necks in the rushing flood driving stakes dragging sacks of earth heaving in boulders and rubble stone others bringing timbers and planks from hundreds of yards away the dim smoky glare of countless torches the burly figures of wearied men begrimed almost beyond semblance of humanity such a picture is more like a strange nightmare that one never forgets and then suddenly there is a general melting away of hundreds of feet of the sodden levee the fight is lost scores of laborers leave for their homes to save what they can of their property from farm to farm the news spreads in the dead hour of the night when all is serene the dread cry comes the levee is broken and then comes a wild stampede for safety many in their night clothes women dragging their babes husbands carrying their wives and the poor negroes wild with terror unable to do anything but stand and view the scene of the waters rushing to bear them to their doom magnificent plantations of yesterday are today seas of rushing foaming water here and there in the shallows stand a few shivering half-starved cattle and occasionally is seen a family still hoping that the flood may not be disastrous clinging to their residence the view of a crevasse in an inland levee miles away from the channel is strikingly grand but for those in its path the grandeur is lost in a feeling of despair and danger the ocean presents a different spectacle for the ocean has no swift current and its waves are greater the foaming mountain torrent cannot compare with it for the mountain torrent is at best but a few yards in breadth but in the swollen river is found an apparently illimitable expanse of water heaving restlessly under the swift foot of the wind or foaming and dashing at the roar of the storm hurling itself in billows upon the toilers on the levee and striking them into the ditch beyond yet with all the fury expended laterally rushing seaward almost with the speed of a train 
for miles between the levee and the main channel the stream pours through a great forest of canebrake or cypress swamp the fearful noise of a crevasse may be heard for a long distance no need to tell the planters far inland the meaning of that distant hoarse murmur approaching the break the murmur swells to a deep sullen roar the water comes tearing through the dense forest at racehorse speed not in a broad belt but closing in from every direction pouring into that break as into an immense funnel as far as the eye can penetrate into that dense gloomy forest it is raggedly carpeted with a heavy tossing sheet of snow-white foam it breaks over stumps snags and the upturned roots of fallen trees flinging white clouds of spray up among the branches of trees overhead mounts in snowy billows over piles of driftwood it snarls hisses and roars like some mad monster at everything in its path and then ploughs in one solid foaming mass into that raging maelstrom between the ragged frothy jaws of the crevasse nearest the break just as it sweeps into the crevasse it curls on either side and huge breakers mark the line where it chafes the crumbling ends of the levee once beyond the broken barriers it plunges into a wild lonesome looking swamp that still shows the tracks of the former disaster here for the first time the real power of this tremendous flood begins to assert itself supple young trees eight or ten inches in diameter are bent and stripped of every leaf their naked branches and twigs whipping the foaming surface of the rustling cataract it sweeps into the standing timber with a hoarse roar foaming around sturdy trunks and here and there one sees a tall tree swaying to and fro like a drunken man then caught in some fierce eddy it is twisted from its roots and reeling round and round it falls into that tremendous current and is swept away to swell the tangled dams of drift beyond as far inland as the eye can reach there is nothing but flood to be seen the currents opening out and racing away in every direction at some distance away may be seen a flooded settlement the water washing the windows of fifteen or twenty abandoned cottages on a huge mound some five or six feet out of the overflow is a group of disconsolate horses and mules who have taken refuge from the rising flood and other hungry-looking brutes wander over the levee but once out of the immediate neighborhood of the break the character of the scene changes the current slackens as the water spreads out like an immense fan and at length becomes almost imperceptible it may come in the night giving no warning of its approach it steals through the grasslands like a serpent the slumbering family hears no sound the water creeps stealthily around the house like the red men in the olden days the morning sun finds it lapping uneasily in the breeze against the threshold the wakening family finds it crawling across the floor towards their beds they look upon a region that appears a vast marsh grass tops bushes little islets and tall trees everywhere rising out of the water in the barnyard the drowsy cattle chew their cuds in peaceful unconsciousness of the wily foe the pig in the lower corner of the lot grunts contentedly to find his wallow freshly moistened the quacking duck paddles complacently about the fields the farmer watches anxiously the progress of the flood trusting that there may be no necessity of leaving valuable property that cannot be removed is taken to the second floor if there be one a boat if there be one is carefully overhauled to be ready for an emergency noon comes the flood has risen but a few inches the cattle eye the water curiously the negroes in their cabins speculate upon the future and each tells his tale of hair-breadth escapes and ventures in other days and one and all agree this ain't no flood show sure no you ought to see the big high water way back in seventy four dat was something like and in humble submission to the opinions of some old granny of unknown age and grizzled wool it is unanimously allowed that we ain't got no cause to be scared this time not much 
so the happy-go-lucky fellows sit and chat while some oily skinned piccaninnies wade to deeper parts of the water cast in their hooks and begin to swap tales of the wonderful fish their progenitors had caught in other floods and to wonder if more brilliant achievements may not be recorded of them the wind rises the great crevasse miles away has widened till it is hundreds of yards in extent and many feet in depth pouring upon the land millions of cubic feet of water every minute with the swelling breeze the flood goes surging inland in long low lazy waves the planters who have not already taken flight conclude it is useless to endeavor to remain if the way is open the cattle are driven inland to the hills some of the negroes straggle after their employers others cling to their rude log cabins all they have to lose it may be that the flood will not be serious so long as cornmeal and bacon abound they may enjoy an endless picnic they can fling their lines from time to time into the stream and perchance vary their repasts with fish fry or turtle stew evening comes the lazy waves now nearly reach the window sills upon the lower floors the cattle left behind low uneasily as they move about in water knee-deep no one is near to feed them and the udders of the cows are swollen with milk here and there a mule is seen stamping impatiently and braying mournfully for lack of feed the water displays a decided but wayward current swirling now this way now that all the land is covered here and there numerous snakes have crawled into the bushes to escape the yellow flood out on the lowland tract a deserted shanty bobs idly along now grounding a moment now floating lazily around a great tree finally becoming an item of the great mass of drift that has lodged at the edge of the forest and swarms with small animals flying from the clutch of the crawling water the game of the cane brakes and swamp regions has fled to the uplands and from time to time some needy refugee family heedless of game laws adds venison to its scanty store the night wears away the negro cabins are deserted most have floated away with the growing current the simple folk have abandoned them some have made their way to the levees hoping for a passing steamer others dwelling above the crevasse have little to fear from currents and as the water rises around them they take to hastily constructed rafts transferring their few household effects thereto and dwelling for days in a floating camp sheltered from the rain by a wagon sheet or old quilts stretched over a low ridge pole mooring the rafts to trees they lead to others a romantic to themselves a precarious existence a whole village deserted by its people wears a singularly melancholy aspect let the reader row with a press correspondent through the little town of bayou serra la as it appears during the recent overflow the town lies on rolling ground dotted here and there with low hills or drifts of sand and alluvial deposits left there by the floods of ages ago even over the center of the roadway back from the front street which is just behind the levee it is unusual to find less than four feet of water while in many places a nine-foot oar cannot be made to touch bottom in some of what in times of low water are beautiful resident streets the boat as it went gliding on the shining moonlight flood would pass so close under the spreading branches of the great live oaks which interlock their boughs over the roadway that her occupants would be compelled to bend down almost level with the gunwales to avoid being swept off the thwarts the freaks of the currents wandering through the flooded streets seem wholly unaccountable sometimes they would run parallel with and at others directly at right angles to the streets often progress would be blocked by long sections of wooden plank sidewalks gates doors and cisterns that had formed barriers across the street while at every turning the boatman would be compelled to dodge huge floating masses of drift in which outhouses timbers sections of roofs and other heavy wreckage inextricably commingling were slowly floating on the lazy current the air was soft and balmy as that of a midsummer night and the mellow light of the young moon that was already hanging low over the great sand hills to the westward spread a soft pale light of deep blue on the bright spangled sky 
There were faint night breezes waving the topmost branches of the great shade trees, but they did not touch the ripless, shining flood which gleamed in long, narrow paths. The white moonbeams that, like ribbons of burnished silver, but slept inky and motionless under the black shadows of the trees, and the rounded outlines of each great shade tree, were sharply reflected in the mirror-like surface of the water, and bordered by a dainty rim of silver. Houses with snow-white walls were faithfully mirrored in that motionless, glittering flood, while to the eastward of each lay a long, deep shadow, a starless night, huge shapeless masses of wreckage drifting past black opaque shadows that grew longer and more intense as the young moon sank so low that her lower horizon was dipping behind a great hoary crested sand hill in the west the scene was exquisitely beautiful but at the same time weird and uncanny not a human voice was heard but near at hand between the lower whisperings of the softly dipping oars came the ever varying chorus of the frogs mingling with the low musical murmuring of the mighty river and the deep sullen roar of the crevasse on the far-off southern shore there the sides of the skiff would brush the perfumed shrubbery of the submerged lawn there could be seen the tree-tops of a splendid orchard just rising out of the flood their lower limbs swaying and bending with the current in all this scene of beautiful ruins there was a sense of utter loneliness that was strangely oppressive of those who a week ago filled this bright and hustling little town to overflowing only six families remain the others have all fled to the adjoining hills leaving their houses to their fate till the water shall have subsided such villages as are not deserted have little to do with the world beyond the post offices are often exhausted in addition to the fact that the nearest points not blockaded are miles away so that the telegraph only brings news from beyond or tells the world how fares the little hamlet the operator may be driven to the upper story or to the roof there to dispute possession with stray turtles or snakes or to listen to the hoarse remonstrance of some old bullfrog whose nocturnal rest is broken by the clicking of the key all around is a dreary waste of water on which the gleam of the moon appears like a ghostly footpath and the dark shadows of the naked limbed trees menace like gaunt spectres from his elevated position the operator may see the flash of the searchlight of a steamer miles away as the vessel flits along the stream collecting refugees from the shores and ever and anon the deep harsh bray of the foghorn breaks the stillness save for these distant tokens of life there is death and silence death and silence all around at the great crevasse itself the spectacle is exciting the fight is not abandoned desperate efforts are made to secure the ends from further washing and that once done there is hope of closing the gap at the extremity of the break a floating pile driver is fiercely hammering heavy timbers into the spongy soil there a tiny fussing tug is engaged in trying to float a mat of brushwood against the broken bank while a score of anxious men are watching an opportunity to peg it down others endeavor to weave pliant branches among the driven piles to afford a better hold for the guano sacks of earth that are being thrown into the break from these moist earth is often washed out by the more powerful current as though it were melting sugar while now and then some timber undermined by the steadily deepening current leaps upward as though endowed with a life of its own and dashes away on the foaming stream after hours of the fierce contest the ends are at last secured the pygmy has stopped the giant the work progresses more easily now that the workers are sure of their ground the stubborn creatures contest every inch of space the roar of the battle goes up incessantly one fights for life the other for liberty such liberty as the tyrant asks of his subjects such liberty as the wolf asks of the sheep or the hawk of the doves such liberty as the strong is always demanded of the weak and defenseless by and by the voice of the struggling monster grows weaker 
the persistent creatures that swarm about him assault him with renewed vigor and pertinacity the roar of the conflict dies away by degrees step by step the two bands of men approach each other only a narrow channel remains presently the forces clasp hands over the chasm in a few moments there remains but a tiny remonstrant murmuring trickle of water another stroke and it is finished the pygmy has conquered the giant the ant has chained the elephant but what in the meantime has been the fate of the district along the levee front here the water does not rise slowly and stealthily as in the regions far inland where the force of the current is lost the planters and all their available forces it may be have been busily fighting the rising floods but have been finally vanquished momentarily by wind and wave hoping to hold the levee few perhaps have removed their families goods or chattels or livestock then when the break comes the raging flood rushes in over the fields and woods demolishing outhouses shaking cottages drowning stock hurling masses of drift against the dwellings that might otherwise stand seeming as though a living genius of destruction here a family carrying only a few changes of clothes and a purse but too scantily filled hurry wildly towards the river front in hope that a passing steamer may pick them up there a planter who has saved his family is hurrying a drove of cattle to the levee vaguely wondering in the meantime how he shall feed them if the flood lasts long here a negro family chattering noisily like frightened crows trudges through water and mire knee-deep or waist-deep bearing on their heads bundles of dirty bedding or old clothes one or two lugging sacks of meal and flitches of bacon with a blind confidence that they have made sufficient provision for every emergency there a forlorn squatter is punting a rude raft with his few belongings slowly athwart the restless flood yonder a band of negroes unaware of the break in time to reach the river have congregated in an old gin house and swarm upon its roof yelling and gesticulating wildly in their terror for aid which they fear will never reach them and as the water rises higher roofs barns hencoops and carcasses go floating past or large against their frail support increasing their peril every moment some moan and cry others pray vigorously confessing their misdeeds with voluble freedom occasionally there is some old crone who terrifies her auditors with the assertion that de lord is sending another vassal flood on men for their wickedness at which the wicked groan and cry and the pious clasp their hands and shout trusting to shortly see the salvation of the lord in the distance appear a few figures perched in trees seeming like enormous crows over yonder some unfortunate has shinned up a telegraph pole which creaks and sways with the rush of the water threatening constantly to return the trembling refugee to the flood beneath the last unfortunates have straggled to the levee the rest must wait for relief here and there a few cattle stand lowing in water half over their sides a restless snorting horse plunges impatiently about a floating tree trunk strikes them from their hillock to swim aimlessly about till other drifting masses ride them down a hen coop floats past on which a hungry chanticleer is perched occasionally challenging the flood and in the meantime with sidelong glance eyeing the confusion and in undertones discussing the case with his half-starved feathered harem it is a motley throng that huddles along the levee that narrow strip of earth but eight feet wide at best is all that is left as a footing for hundreds the wares swash heavily at their feet or sometimes as the wind blows stronger they leap clear over the frail embankment trudging wearily back and forth on the clay slippery dikes are planters once well-to-do with families of culture and refinement others of a middle class and occasionally specimens of a type denominated by the man and brother as po white trash are to be seen among the throng the man and brother is usually in the majority in the lowland districts and adds greatly to the picturesqueness of the levees in time of flood 
some rear their tiny excuses for tents along the bank and spend the time in uneasily watching the turbid water occasionally some dinah or chloe who has been on the levee for a week goes through the motion of washing clothes in the surging stream gaining thereby the approval of conscience over a duty performed whether the garments be improved or not here there is little concern these being wandering roustabouts who had nothing to lose there some grizzled uncle tom bemoans the loss of his two scrawny mules and the few pigs and fowls and his favorite cow which represent the savings of years from his toil in his little patch of corn and cotton and he feels even sorer over his losses than the rich planter who has lost a hundred times as much and so the little bands assemble mingle and disperse comparing notes and all waiting in painful anxiety for some steamer to pick them up before the sodden levee should dissolve beneath their feet and leave them struggling in the stream at length the government relief boat appears and gathers the throngs by hundreds to transport them to higher lands beyond the levee skiffs and flatboats move about the submerged region picking up the people who have taken refuge on the housetops among the trees or on piles of drift none on the levee fear being passed in the night for the powerful searchlight illuminates every straggling group on reaching a place of safety from the waters scores of the refugees are almost penniless and the question of food is a pressing one the liberal contributions of scores of generous souls suffice but for a short time the government must again come to the front and issue rations or a money equivalent sufficient to maintain the destitute till the falling of the waters allows them to resume labor upon their lands after that the crop lien system in vogue in the south enables the people to get credit of their merchants until the cotton picking or the corn gathering when the waters subside and the people return it is often difficult to find old landmarks in one place huge trenches may be washed out but away from the immediate vicinity of the crevasse the land is covered with mud varying from a few inches to four or five feet in thickness sufficient guarantee of amazing fertility when the ground becomes dry enough to work in the numerous little depressions in the surface are stagnant pools that linger for a month or two the larger ones if not before filled are converted into ponds or marshes which only thorough draining will destroy the air is tainted by the hundreds of carcasses that are entangled in the heaps of drift the hot dank soil steaming under the summer sun brings disease in the wake of the flood louisiana from its character is usually the principal sufferer the arkansas borders fare little better all along the course of the stream the land is dotted with lakes and pools and marshy lands created by former overflows along the lower portion of the river bayous or sloughs open from either bank and meander lazily towards the gulf as showing the character of the country may be mentioned the little and st francis rivers which flow southward from southeast missouri nearly parallel to the mississippi and but forty miles from it at their furthest points in flowing one hundred and twenty miles south they double and twist expanding into sluggish bayous as broad as the mississippi itself or into shallow island dotted lakes and the total length of the numerous bends and whimsical curves of the main stream st francis is over two hundred miles in like manner pine bluff arkansas is but fifty miles from the mouth of the sluggish sandy arkansas as the crow flies but to follow the windings of that stream the distance is nearly three times as great the backwater of the mississippi finds its way into these sluggish channels and renders comparatively useless any levees on the banks of the great river near their mouths and from the northern border of arkansas to the gulf the old father of waters pursues a course as intricate in its winding as the st francis it is asserted by many that the mouth of the stream was once perhaps not far below memphis and that all the land to the southward has been produced partly by slow upheaval of the sea bottom and partly by the alluvial deposits of the river 
and the gradual extension of its delta which now projects many miles into the gulf this would account for the low and swampy character of the land in the entire region the writer has endeavored to give an accurate general view of southern floods while differing in some features from floods in other lands they themselves are much alike the description of a flood of today would answer with but little adaptation as a narrative of fifty years ago and further details of particular flood scenes are unnecessary such great overflows are not common the levees holding the river in check on ordinary occasions yet one flood season deserves more than passing notice end of floods in the south